So I'm noticing more and more that my channel's kind of like a LIFO data structure, last in, first out, because as soon as something bright, shiny, and exciting pops up, I put six or seven other videos on the back burner to get to it. But I want to try to make this introduction short, because if you notice my YouTube chart last night, I got Clipper firmware running on the Artillery Sidewinder X3 Plus, which to me is pretty monumental, because this has been a long time coming. I spent a fair amount of time going back and forth with people from Artillery. They were saying, well, you know, our firmware isn't open sourced yet, blah, 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 blah. I don't know if we're going to do that, yeah, yeah, yeah. But eh, sometimes you have to use a little leverage with them, and eh, I kind of got what I wanted. I managed to get the electrical schematic file with the chip information that had all the pinouts and everything. And from that point, all I really needed was a bootloader offset to get this thing working. So yesterday morning, I received the schematics. I was able to start mapping out all of the pins necessary for a clipper install, but then I was having trouble getting the binary to flash, and turns out that it was a bootloader offset that needed to be... Well, I'll, I'll, I'll show you as I do the installation, but if we see right here, I've got clipper running on the BTT Pad 7. I'm tied in right now via USB-C going into the front, but future Endeavor is going to be to install a BTT Pi into this machine and then use the tool drawer here as my access point. And from there, the option is going to be to either install the HDMI 5 screen over here, which would have some cabling and stuff sticking out, which I'm not really sure that I want, or I can tap into another instance of Clipper on the BTT Pad 7, and I can control it wirelessly through the Wi-Fi network, which I, th I think I'm kind of leaning towards. If you watch my video of multiple instances, you'll notice that I did that with the Soval SVO 7 Plus. I was able to control it via Wi-Fi, even though it was still running its own Pi-based, if you will, controller. So to just run through some of the functions on the machine, ah, f well, since my stupid circus lighting died, I'm going to have to do this au naturel, but I just wanted to run through some of the functionality that is working with Clipper right now. Everything seems to be working okay. I haven't done any test prints just yet, but I've got the overhead gantry light working. You see right there, the overhead gantry light's working. I've got the tool head light working. I've got the machine homing, which obviously that's a fundamental feature. It moves around as it should. This machine actually has a separate MCU fan that is controlled by a pin. So on here, you could see I've got this MCU fan section. You may not be able to see it on the screen, but I've got this separate MCU fan right here. And you can set it to go on and off at specific temperatures. So you can tell Clipper, I want the fan to turn on at... I don't know, whatever temperature. I want my board to stay at a relative temperature, say 30 degrees Celsius, something like that. And the fan will turn itself on and off depending on what temperature is inside the control unit here. If I go under more and I go to bed mesh, I can load the default bed mesh. You can see that I did a bed mesh measurement. I've got it set to 100 points right now, which is kind of overkill, but for right now, I'm just going to leave it the way it is. I've already calibrated my Z offset via the old paper trick. As far as all of the controls are concerned, hot end fan for part cooling, it's controlled here. The heat sink fan will go on when the hot end starts up or when it's above 50 degrees Celsius, which on this machine still heats up insanely fast. I, I, I really like the way that this thing heats up, I, but I digress. Under the LED section, I've got two different options. I've got LED light, which is for controlling the overhead light. So if I go here, on, and off. And then I move Z down just so you could see it a little bit better. But under hot end NeoPixel, I've got control over red, green, and blue. And obviously a combination of the three. I haven't run input shaping just yet. I have to figure out a place to mount the ADXL, which is always the issue. But let me get into how I configured this and how you can do the same. 
I'll also be including the CFG file on my GitHub page because this did take a lot of playing around with to get right. So before I get into this, I just want to point out that this is for those that have experience with installing Clipper. This is not a step-by-step how-to to install Clipper. This is just an overview of what I've done to get this to work on the Sidewinder X3 Plus. And I'm going to go over some of the printer.cfg features that I've added or functions that I've added or things that I've had to change in order to get this to actually work. So that being said, if you need a video on how to install Clipper, check out my Clipper install playlist. And I've got damn near a dozen different videos on how to install Clipper onto different devices at this point. So this should not be a foreign concept to anybody that is watching this video. So to get started, you obviously need a Linux device and you need to install Clipper via any means necessary, but the way that is typically done is you install Linux, you enable SSH, you get into the Linux device via SSH session, and you install the Kaya script. And then once you run through the Kaya script, you can install Clipper, you can install Moonraker, you can install Obico, you can install Crow's Nest, blah, 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 blah. So let's just pretend that we've all done that and gotten to this point so far. So in this case, the first thing I want to do is SSH into the device. So SSH, and in my case, it's going to be username bq at bttpad7.local. For you, it'll be your username at whatever your device name is or at the IP address that your device resides on. Put in your login password. So as usual, the first thing we have to do in order to install Clipper onto the machine would be to compile the Clipper binary. But if we go into cd dot slash clipper and we go to make menu config, under the make menu config, the bootloader offsets that are available for the STM32F401 are 32 kibby bytes, 64 kibby bytes, and 16 kibby bytes. There's also no bootloader. You would use a no bootloader if you were doing a DFU flash and you were using a USB cable and using the STM32 program to flash the processor. But I fought long and hard on this to be able to get all the information necessary to make it so that we can just compile the binary, put it onto an SD card and flash via the SD card. So none of this USB cable, no GPIO pins or no special STM32 flash modules, nothing like that. This is going to be as simple as can be with the tools that we currently have. That being said, I've got a pull request put into the Clipper GitHub for the additional features that are needed in order to make the binary for this machine. As of right now, I cannot compile the proper binary because it doesn't have the correct bootloaders. So instead of starting off by making the Clipper binary, I have to go into the Clipper subfolder. So I'll go into cd dot slash src slash stm32. And then from there, I can run sudo nano kconfig. Actually, it's capital, kconfig. Once I'm in the kconfig file, if I page down, we'll see that there's different sections. There's a chip section, and then scroll down more, and we get to this bootloader section right here. Under the bootloader section, this board requires a 48 kibby byte bootloader. So on this line right here, this bool 48 kibby byte bootloader, if next to the STM32F4X5, if we just put these two pipes, which signifies an OR, and we type in MACH underscore STM32F401, this will put the 48 kibby byte bootloader into the STM32 F401 option. If I just used F4, it would put it into every instance of F4, whatever, whatever. So it doesn't have to be a 401, it could be a 405, a 407, a 440, whatever the hell. But in this case, I just wanna make it an F401 because there's a possibility that some of these may not even have the ability to have a 48 kibby byte bootloader. What do I know? So once I put that in, I could do a control X to exit, hit Y to save, and then enter to confirm. Once I exit out of there, I can go back to my main Clipper directory by going CD tilde slash Clipper. 
and then from there make menu config. Once you're inside of the make menu config, go down to your microcontroller architecture. And if you haven't done so yet, select the STM32. Processor model is going to be the STM F401. Despite the fact that this machine has an STM32 F402, it's an identical processor. Under the bootloader offset, we now have the option for the 48 KB byte bootloader. So we select that. Clock reference is 8 MHz crystal. And then the communication is correct with USB on PA11, PA12 if you're using the USB on the front. There are additional pins that are available on the Sidewinder mainboard, such as the Wi-Fi pins right here that can be used. If we tap into the TX and RX on this Wi-Fi module, we should be able to use UART communication and circumvent using the front USB port. And also there is a 24 volt output right here that could be tapped into that I'm probably going to use on my machine when I install the BTT Pi because the BTT Pi runs 24 volt native. But in this case, because I'm running on the pad seven, I select USB on PA11, PA12, which is correct. And then from there, Q to quit, Y to save, do a make clean to clean the directory out and then make. Once that happens, it'll create the new clipper binary. And like always, we go into WinSCP and start a session inside of WinSCP. Inside of our home folder, we go to the clipper folder, the out folder. And then once the binary is compiled, we will see it all right here. It takes a couple of seconds. And then we have our clipper.bin. Clipper.bin, we right click on that, select rename, and change it to YUNTU. Yuntu. This yuntu.bin is going to be the file that we need to flash onto our main board. So from here, we would just copy this to our SD card. So if we have an SD card inserted, we could see it over here in our list of drives. Just grab it, drag it over, take that binary, put it into the machine, disconnect the original screen because that sometimes hangs up the firmware installations power on the device, and then give it about a minute or two. From there, turn it off, remove the SD card, turn the machine on, plug in the USB, and from there, we should be able to see the device in the Linux system. So we should be able to do an LS USB and see the Open Moco STM32 F401 XC device right here. Once we do that, we could do our ls slash dev slash serial slash by id, or we could also do slash by path. I found that by path is more robust when you're dealing with multiple instances on a single device because you're separating based on the USB port number rather than the device ID because the device ID may have a tendency to be similar or the same. So just do a by path slash star to get the full extension. And then you could just grab it, control C to copy it. And then inside of the printer.cfg, there's a whole bunch of things that had to be added and a whole bunch of things that needed to be changed. So looking at the pinout diagram on the right for the STM32 that's on the Sidewinder X3 board, comparing it to the pin sections that I have on the left here in my printer CFG, we could see that the very first option is the LED light command. And that is tagging on to pin number PC2. The initial white being a one will default the light to being in the full on state. The LED section is a PWM section. So you can choose whatever brightness you want right here. And it'll just start up in that state. The NeoPixel section underneath that controls the hot end light because it is set up as a NeoPixel. It's running off of a single pin, PD2 but it uses PWM to control what color or what colors come out of that single pin. The color order is GRB because that is the order that the pixels are in. They're in green, red, blue. If the LED were in a different order, you would have to change the order here to get the sliders to be proper inside of the clipper interface. Initial red, green, and blue being one will make it so that it outputs a white light. So I do have to correct myself in my review video. I said it was an RGBW, but it's not. It is just an RGB LED, and it uses the three 
colors combine to create the white light that you see in the full bright state. I haven't really gone through and messed around with any of my base macros. I started making a load and unload macro because the machine itself does not have a release for the filament on the extruder. So I still have to put in the hot end commands, but basically just make a macro for load and unload. It's got the standard macros, calibrate probe, which just runs probe calibrate, PID nozzle, PID bed, the idle timeout macro, which lets you set up how much time the machine can sit before the motors and stuff turn off, etc., etc. There's nothing new and unusual here. The MCU section is going to be the same. It's going to be serial and then the path. This is a copy and paste from one of my existing configs, so it's got some input shaper values. They're not correct because I haven't run the input shaper yet. I still have to set it up with the position point for the input shaping. I've got to set up screws tilt adjust and things like that, but ultimately all the stepper pins for X, Y, and Z all have to match what is going on over here. Same with the extruder. And because there's so many fans on this machine, I have to have a couple different fan sections, one of them being the heater fan section for cooling off the heat sink, the standard fan for the part cooler, and then this temperature fan right here is what I set up to display the fan icon right here. And we could see that right now the current temperature is 26 degrees. I've got it set to a target of 35, and this little icon isn't spinning. But if I were to make this 20 degrees, you can see right here the fan icon starts to animate to let you know that the fan is on. There's also an LED status light that comes on when this turns on. You don't see it, but it's there. If you pull the drawer out and you look inside at the board, you'll see the little fan. And when it's on, a red LED comes on. But aside from that, that was pretty much it. All the other stuff is pretty standard. Probe section for the inductive sensor, safe Z home and bed mesh for the auto bed level. Like I said, I have to set up the screws tilt adjust. So I've got the manual control over the screws. So it'll go over and measure each of the positions and I can use the wheels to make the adjustments, or I can use bed leveler 5000 with clipper as well. But really the biggest thing that had to be done was that 48 Kibby bite bootloader offset. And I do keep saying Kibby bite because there is a difference between Kibby bytes and kilobytes. If we look right here, one Kibby bite equals 1.024 kilobytes. So if I said 48 Kibby bite offset bootloader, it's actually 49.152 kilobyte which kind of threw me off when I first started digging into this stuff because I didn't even know that a Kibby bite existed. So truth be told, this was new to me a couple of months ago as well. So my takeaways are that the new artillery board is much easier to flash than the previous models where you had to use DFU mode and you had to use a USB cable and an STM32 flashing utility. And it's also easier than the previous procedure that I found online, which included the exact same method with the STM32 software. Keep in mind that it does need a 48 KB byte bootloader, and in order to do that, you have to follow the instructions on how to open up the kconfig file, but other than that, it is very straightforward. The printer.cfg had to be built from the ground up, but it will be available on my GitHub page at www.github.com slash engineer. and I will be posting more print videos very soon after I do the usual tuning of this machine. So that'll about wrap it up for this video. If you like it, hit the thumbs up. If you like this type of content and haven't done so yet, please subscribe to the channel. And if you know somebody who'd be interested in this type of stuff, share it with a friend because sharing is caring. Check out my affiliate links in the description down below at no additional cost to you. It just puts a little bit of catnip into my kitty and it helps with my future channel endeavors. If you want to toss me a little bit of catnip, become a patron at www.patreon.com slash engineer. I've had it for a while, but I don't really like to advertise it. If you got 10 seconds to kill, even though I haven't updated it in a while, check out my website at www.theferalengineer.com. It's just a whole bunch more of the same stuff, but it justifies the 12 bucks a year I spend on the URL. And once again, thank you to all of my catnip contributors, both past, present, and future. Thank you for watching, and see you again soon.